Uh, good afternoon again. Um, my name is Nama. I am a glaucoma specialist by training. Um, and at Google, I work on a team that applies machine learning to medical data, specifically medical images. These are my financial disclosures. Now, you might be asking yourself, what is an eye doctor doing at Google? I've been asked that question many, many times, um, and uh, for, for good reason. So um, the truth is that um, my journey to Google, or my journey from a clinic clinician to a machine, clinical machine learning researcher at Google, um, started as a complete coincidence. So uh, I am not an engineer. I have not written a line of code. I have no background in machine learning. Um, and I actually did not know that Google was doing anything that has to do with ophthalmology. Uh, a friend of mine who was doing a project at Google, he's a, an emergency room physician, he came up to me and asked, he said, you know, um, I heard they're looking for ophthalmologists. Can I give your name? I said, sure, no problem. Um, so I joined. At the beginning, what they asked me to do was just look at photos and say whether there's diabetic retinopathy or not. But really, very quickly, fairly quickly, I realized two things. One, that machine learning has the potential to revolutionize the way we practice medicine and improve healthcare, the way we deliver healthcare. And the second thing was that we have to do this as a joint effort. Doctors can't do this alone, and tech companies can't do it alone. Um, I want to talk to you today about three things. One, what machine, learn, what machine learning actually is. Two, what is the potential of machine learning to transform the way we deliver healthcare and empower doctors. And three, basically what every ophthalmologist needs to know about machine learning because machine learning is coming. So let's start with a quiz. Look at this from this photo. Tell me what you think. Does this patient have diabetic retinopathy? No. No. Okay, good. That's an easy, that's an easy one. Even a glaucoma specialist can answer that. Is this person a smoker? Why? You said no? Why? Sorry? I couldn't hear that, but... Oh, okay, you can't, you can't tell. Okay. Um, some people sometimes say, some doctors sometimes say um, yes or no, and the reasoning goes around the blood vessels, right? They say, oh, the blood vessels, the arteries are narrow, so high, highly or more likely that this person is a smoker. How old is this person? Sorry? You have to guess. Okay. Again, of course we don't know exactly, but you can say somewhere between 40 and 60 because the reflex, the sheen of youth is no longer there, but there are no uh, age-related signs yet. Is this a man or a woman? Yeah, okay, this is where everybody laughs. Okay, we'll get back to this. So machine learning is all around us, whether we are aware of it or not. This is machine learning. This is machine learning under very complicated, unforgiving real life conditions. And this is machine learning. And if you're not aware of uh, or not familiar with the game Go, it's a board game that has relatively simple rules, but, is, but very quickly gets very complicated because look at the size of the board. Now, many people thought that it would take years until a computer could beat a human in a match of uh, Go. And in 2016, DeepMind's AlphaGo algorithm beat Lee Seidel, the world champion, at a match of Go. This is also machine learning. Machine learning is not only in um, complicated and sophisticated applications like self-driving cars. It's in things we use on a daily basis. Again, whether we are aware of it or not. 
It's when we search photos, unlabeled photos in the photo app, when we use text sensitive, sensitive uh, email suggest reply suggestions, or when we use a translation app. So what is machine learning actually? And the truth is, when I joined Google, I thought I knew what machine learning is, or artificial intelligence, or at least I thought I had a good idea. But actually, as I started working with Google, I realized that I have no idea what it is, and that machine learning and clinical practice, or teaching machines to do what clinicians do, doesn't translate one-to-one. -one. So this is a document that I put together for Google. When doctors come and join us, um, explaining, explaining what it means and um, how it affects what we do at Google. So machine learning is a type of artificial intelligence that enables a computer to learn how to perform a task without being explicitly told how to do it. Deep learning is a type of, of machine learning that has been proven very effective in the past six years, five to six years. Now you might have heard of different types of machine learning. There is supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, a bunch of different things. Everything I will show you today and talk about today is supervised learning. So what does that actually mean? It means that if we want to use, if we want to train a computer, teach a computer to detect that a photo has a panda in it, using traditional vision, computer vision techniques, we would have to tell the computer up front what are the features of a panda. A big white face, black ears, black eyes, black nose, and then the computer could apply those rules and tell that a photo has a panda in it. Using machine learning or deep learning, all we have to do is give the computer the photo and tell it it's a panda, give it a label. We call it a label. So the photo with a label. And then the computer figures out the associations in the data by itself. So the key insight here is that it is now easier to program computers to learn than it is to hard code them to be smart. And why do we apply machine, machine learning or deep learning to medicine? Deep learning is very useful in situations where we have a lot of data to look through and we don't have enough people to do it or enough expertise to do it. And this is exactly the situation in diabetic retinopathy. And you'll hear a lot about diabetic retinopathy uh, later in the session. So I'll just give a very quick uh, overview. We have over 400 million people with diabetes in the world today. All of them need their annual screening for diabetic retinopathy. There aren't enough doctors to even check or screen all of these people. And even in diabetic retinopathy screening programs where they take a photo, there aren't enough doctors to look through all these photos. So the team at Google that I joined, um, they were thinking, and this was done before, regretfully before I joined, they were thinking, could we train a machine learning algorithm to detect diabetic retinopathy in a fundus photo? So they um, collaborated with two big hospitals in India, Shankaranathralaya and Arvind. You'll hear about that as well. Um, and they, they had 130,000 images of diabetic patients. They built a labeling tool and they onboarded 54 ophthalmologists to look through these images and grade them on the ICDR diabetic retinopathy scale, from no diabetic retinopathy to proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And they used all this data to train a model that can now tell whether a fundus photo, if it's shown a new fundus photo that it's never seen, it can now say whether a patient has diabetic retinopathy or not. And this, was, this paper was published in 2016 and the algorithm actually turned out to be very, very uh, accurate. The AUC here is 99, uh, 99%, um, and it's on par with ophthalmologists. Additional work done on uh, the same data improved the algorithm, and it is now on par with retina specialists who are the gold standard for diabetic retinopathy diagnoses. So building on that work, our team thought, what else can we do? We know that the eye is a window to the rest of the body, that the eye is the only organ where you can see the capillaries, the, the axons, the actual inside of the body with, uh, from, from the outside. So they were thinking, 
maybe we can predict risk for cardiovascular events just for, by looking at uh, fundus photos. Now, as you can see, thank you. Um, so this paper, as you can see, did a great job in predicting risk factors for the cardiovascular disease, high, uh, blood pressure, hemoglobin A1C, and a bunch of other things. And it also, for the overall cardiovascular risk, or risk for MACE, um, major adverse cardiac events, it achieved an, an AUC of 0.7. Now this is not amazing, but it means there's some signal that we still need to work on. So if we go back to the quiz from the beginning, is this person a smoker? This algorithm could detect or could predict whether a person is a smoker or not with an accuracy or with an AUC of 0.71. And if you look at the um, photo on the right, you see that gray hue on the, on the gray photo? That is how or where the f algorithm is looking to make its prediction. And it looks like it's somewhere, somewhere around the vessels. Now, don't forget this is a single example. This is not what the algorithm was looking on in every, each and every one of the photos. What about age? The algorithm can predict age with an uh, absolute error of three and a little bit years. This is pretty nice. And if we look at, again, the, the explanation or attention mask is what we call it, all that uh, green on the gray, it looks at largely on the vessels, but not only. And then in this, is this a man or a woman? And this is the mind-blowing uh, finding of this paper. The algorithm could, could uh, predict self-reported sex with an AUC of 0.97. And if we look at the example, we can see that the algorithm is actually highlighting both the macula and the optic nerve in this specific example. Now, the story of this finding, okay, why would anyone try to predict self-reported sex or sex from a fundus photo? This was actually a task given to an intern who joined the team and had to learn how to, how to train machine learning models. So she was given this task, and nobody expected this to come with anything. And she came back and said, well, actually, I'm getting a good prediction. And the team was like, no way, you're doing something wrong. Go back and do it again. And she went back and did it again, and the accuracy went, only, went up. And the more she worked on it, and the more everybody looked at it, the accuracy went up and up and up. So it's not... It's not that uh, this is a useful or clinically useful prediction. There are easier ways of finding out whether a person is a man or a woman. But, but this is an example of the power of machine learning or the power of deep learning. And to tell you the truth, when I joined the team, um, I was thinking, okay, I am here to teach the computer. And the computer will learn to imitate me. It will try to be like me. Uh, but it will never be as good as me, and it will never be better than me because I am the expert, right? And it's only imitating me. But when I saw this, I was like, okay, this is big, and this is powerful. So our take-home message number one is that deep learning is a very powerful tool. So we have a nice algorithm that can predict or detect diabetic retinopathy in fundus photos. What will the algorithm say when we show it this photo? What do you think? Sorry? Malignant melanoma. Okay. What about this? Papilledema. End stage glaucoma. What did we train the algorithm to detect? What did you train it? I told you about the algorithm. We trained it to detect diabetic retinopathy. So what will it say when it sees all these? No diabetic retinopathy. And this brings us to the second take-home message. The algorithm will only be as good as what we show it or as what we teach it. So if we train it to detect diabetic retinopathy, that's what it'll do. And if it sees something that doesn't look like diabetic retinopathy, it will say no diabetic retinopathy. Okay, so that's something that's very important because this is very different 
than how humans think, right? We look at a photo and we immediately know if it's normal or abnormal, right? And if it's normal, good. If it's abnormal, we start thinking, okay, what's abnormal about it and what's the, di the differential diagnosis? That's not how the algorithms are trained, unfortunately, right? They're trained to do a specific task, and that's what they know how to do. Okay, a few more examples, and we can go quickly on this, um, of things that we do that are not diabetic retinopathy and are built upon the diabetic retinopathy and cardiovascular work that I showed you. This is a, a work that was published um, in December in Nature Biomedical Engineering, and this is a, a model that can actually detect anemia and hemoglobin levels from a fundus photo. So if you see the black, ar the black ROC curve is from age and gender or metadata, dem demographics only, and when we show the algorithm the photo only, it actually is much more accurate. Another example is work that um, actually was published last month, and this is an algorithm that was trained to detect diab uh, diabetic macular edema from fundus photos. But when we trained the algorithm, we gave it a photo, a fundus photo, and the label, remember the panda, the label? The label for the photo was driven or was taken from an OCT scan. So the model learned to look at a fundus photo and s basically say what's in the OCT, okay? And it's doing a great job. And the nice thing about it is that the model can extract three-dimensional information from a two-dimensional image. And think about a screening setting. If we put a relatively cheap camera, right, because camera, fundus cameras are much cheaper than OCTs, we can get OCT level accuracy from fundus photos. So this is very promising. Another example, this looks very similar, but it's completely different. This is an algorithm that was trained using the ARIDS data to predict progression to neovascular AMD. So again, the model was given a fundus photo, and the label was this person developed neovascular AMD a year later. And the model was trained to predict that. Um, the model, predict, the model uh, accuracy was about 0.7 or 0.77. Again, it's not amazing. It's not as accurate as the diabetic retinopathy uh, algorithm but it means there's signal. Anything above 0.5 means there's, there is some signal in the data. So in general, if we think about machine learning, there are two buckets or two, thing, two main things that machine learning can do for us. One, it can automate repetitive tasks. It can do things that we can do, but are either not good use of our time, or there aren't enough of us, there aren't enough eye doctors in the world to do them, like screening. And it can also find new signals in the data, things that we can't do, predict progression, okay, for example. So just a few words about what it means to train a model. And again, what I said at the beginning that everything that, or what I think every ophthalmologist should know, this is one of them. We need to be able to understand what it means when someone comes and says, I trained a model. So when we, tr when we um, want to apply machine learning, there are three things we need to take into account. We need to have an objective. It uh, uh, should be useful, something like detecting diseases in medical images. We need data. Typically, we need a lot of data. We want it labeled. We want it to be fair. And we want it to be representative of the task that we're trying to achieve or we're trying to teach the model to do. And we need a model for continuous optimization. So for example, if we want to train a model to say whether a photo is of a cat or a dog, we need lots of photos of cats and dogs. We need them labeled correctly. So a cat is a cat and a dog is a dog. And then we show all of these to the model and it learns when it sees a new photo to say whether it is of a cat or a dog. In the same manner, we treat medical, um, we treat medical imaging machine learning models Let's say we want to know if, some, if, a, if a photo is of a glaucomatous or not. We take a lot of photos. We label them as glaucoma or not glaucoma. We show them to the model, and hopefully it learns to, the, to do this task. More? Sorry? Cut it? Okay. Okay. Just one more thing. Very practical. 
what, um, once we train a model, we want to know if it's, if it's working well, right? If it's doing what it's supposed to do. So we have a development set, and we test the model on a test set. We got an AUC of 9.5. It's very high. Is that enough? No. We, the numbers are not enough. We want to see that the model, or we want to see, evaluate the results qualitatively, because the model can actually learn things that we didn't expect it to learn, like the notch from the camera, or things that are very, very distinctive, like PRP scars. We also wanted to generalize. So the fact that we have a model that worked on one test set is not enough. We want to see that it works on multiple data sets, from multiple camera types, from multiple populations, from multiple geographic locations. We want to see that it's not only validated clinically, but also see that it generalizes. And the missing piece, or the one important piece that you'll hear a lot about, is we want to see that it actually works in the real world. So the fact that you train a good model, an accurate model, in the lab is not enough. It doesn't mean that it will work in the real world. You have to see how it uh, integrates into workflows in the clinic, in different places, in different clinics, in different countries. So just in conclusion, deb deb deep learning algorithms are a promising tool for ophthalmology. We need high quality data. We want to see that it, it validates and it generalizes. And, and again, we as ophthalmologists need to know what machine learning is and we need to be ready for uh, the prime time when it's coming. Thank you. No, from the photograph. This no, is no. from the photograph. Yes, the, the model only sees it just the sees pixels the of the photo. It doesn't see any metadata. Doing retina and doing things, I cannot say this is a Absolutely male or female. Absolutely true. So, so uh, like to know, because you know Google has everybody's data. Yeah. So I still have my skeptical mind doubting the differentiation male and female. No. Is there any clue? I like to know or we all like to know. We all are no, no, it is absolutely yeah. true. I'll just tell that because this study, when we started 2013-14, there were initial set of images which we gave. It was all anonymized data. And only two things were given, gender and retinal image. And then I had a chance, 2013-14, I think, to go to Mountain View. And they told me, photograph is detecting 95% accuracy diabetic retinopathy, 99% gender. So this is something, but uh, again, we can have off the, uh, after the uh, talk, we Sorry. can have this discussion. Yeah, because yeah. The, it basically looks at the vessels, disc, macula. I think that's something yeah. and, which... And another telling. thing, we as ophthalmologists never asked ourselves, because we never needed to tell if it's a man or a woman looking at the, at the fundus, right? Maybe if we had to, maybe we would have, maybe we would have done it. Fine. So thank you, Dr. Nama. We'll, I have, we have four more talks. After that, we'll have a discussion. We can have it during lunch. Uh, definitely, Dr. Nama very rightly said that deep learning is today. It is not uh, something for future. We are all seeing it every day, and it is coming in our health care. I'll request Dr. Raj Lakshmi. She will be talking about demystifying the use of AI in diabetic eye care screening. One good thing is that there's been a lot of evidence which is created from India, starting from the 2016 article, even Dr. Natarajan, who pre made the recent JAMA ophthalmology article, a lot of work on AI has emerged from our country. This is something.